Hi, welcome to this week's edition of Blues Talk. We're again John, Dave and myself are going to look back over our nine try emphatic victory against Treviso and look back at also all the other uh, results of the of the Pro 12 and also preview the B&I Cup game. Apologise for not uh, being on air last weekend. There was a few technical gremlins. So lads, anyway, a nine try win against Treviso. Uh, pretty good display. Turning around our, our Two game losing streak. Oh well, so just to say the first thing. I mean, it is actually impossible to win against Treviso. Um, if you lose, you lose. If you win without a bonus point, you're a disgrace for not getting a bonus point. If you get a bonus point, you lose because it's only Treviso. And if you score nine tries, sure it was only Treviso. So, mm. you know, sometimes it's 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 one of these lose lose situations. I thought Leinster did very very well they took all the opportunities that presented themselves i mean there's not much else you can do really i mean in, when you're in the situation like, against a team like Teresa, who have basically gone off on their summer holidays to all intents and purposes um there's not a whole lot you can do and leinster did everything they could do and they got their they got nine tries i mean what more it, do you want what more do you want i mean a 60 odd point wallop <clears throat> uh, it doesn't it doesn't record league win yeah, in fact there's nothing else leinster could have done in that match and they did it and that's good <laughs> but isn't that a bit sad really that you kind of look back on a game like that and you think well you know we we you know we, we couldn't really have won any other way mm. when you consider that the last two matches we've played Treviso away we've only beaten them by a point and mm-hmm. in point of fact last season's game I think Sexton got a last second drop yeah. goal to, to get the victory well you know it was a very entertaining game I thought I really like from a neutral's point of view they were throwing the ball around scoring tries Doing the hard stuff, they you know they they didn't lose focus. They scored a try in the last minute, uh, and they were hungry for you know there was a bit of a dip in the middle after Boss was carded and uh, you know but apart from that they really went for it the whole time. They didn't let up and that team okay they didn't play very well the Treviso team but on paper it's there's a very Italian good team. team. It was you know the mm. Italian uh, Six Nations team with a few extras you know so. Uh, okay, they they were you know there was a bit there was periods of comedy tackling from them and lack of uh, cohesion. Uh, they looked like they were all playing in different teams at times, but you know, hmm. Le- Leinster came out, went at them. They used all the inventive stuff. They ran different lines. They ran dummy runners. They, they had Fanning coming out around the corner at you know at, in quite a lot of instances in in the first half, where they really uh, you know they were showing off. Yeah. Let's face it, you know that that'll do me on a good Friday. Thanks see, very much. I, I mean, I, I, as I said, like the the Treviso team were to all intents and purposes mentally not there, mm. right? But that's not Leinster's problem. Leinster's problem is still got to play them. Is beating whatever team does show up. But isn't it and what Leinster did was they didn't just beat them; they beat them well. So Leinster can't actually do anything about the Italian mindset. All they can do is all they can control is their own mindset mm. and Which they by, did. by by being so ruthless for the entire duration of the game i mean we've often complained about Leinster taking the foot off the pedal when they got the bonus point yeah. you know even if there's half an hour or even 40 minutes le- left they didn't do that they didn't mm. and they scored a try with uh, jack McGrath in the bin i think it was mm-hmm. about their i think it was their fifth try they scored mm. uh, after half time there's a bit there was a big gap between their fourth and fifth tries where uh, it went very flat when Boss was carded. It yeah. seemed to take the steam out of us. And uh, Low Manu getting the very that, nasty yeah. Uh, injury. Yeah, but that was early enough, wasn't it? I know, but still, it's just the game. Yeah, yeah. Definitely broke up, but but you know they still kept they kept going. Apart from that period between, I think the fourth try was scored about twenty five minutes and, and sixty for the next one. Was Atlantic it sixty? Rides, yeah. Okay, well, I mean, there's a, there's a fair gap. You know, that that's uh, nearly half the game. So we scored nine tries in half of the game, and <laughs> we we also scored at least one of them with with fourteen players on the field. You know, uh, so but, but like <clears throat> just what Dave was saying, you know, it it maybe is a bit of an Irish trait that we're very critical, hypercritical of the opposition teams when when we do put a, a large score on. Mm. But you think back, like if the All Blacks played against any other tier one nation and put 50 or 60 points on them which they often have done as they have as they did Ireland a couple of seasons ago Mm -hmm. you know it's like well that's how bloody good we are in New Zealand that's we're the best you know it's not kind of critical of the it is an Irish trait it is it's that self deprecation self deprecation almost self loathing sometimes on occasion Um, oh I can't possibly be any good Leinster, all Leinster can be responsible for is their own mental attitude and their own <clears> and the Leinster's mental attitude was excellent. Now there were still things that you'd you'd like Leinster to do better. Of course. Um but in terms of their attitude and their preparation mm. and their focus on the game, you couldn't really complain. But I think for once this season, 
our moves you know uh, paid off or, or came off ball stuck there was fantastic continuities we we'll rattle through the nine tries but there was some great continuity you know where there was umpteen phases of play and lovely offloads for a lot of the tries which hadn't really we haven't seen very often this season there was a lot of good um there was a lot of good lines taken um mm. some of the stuff that was you know kind of I, I not not necessarily pre prepared but you know pre planned kind I of think came, a lot came of it off pre planned yeah, yeah came off um and you know again it's it's very hard to discuss the match because you know we were much better than them and that's you know pre all praise to Leinster um I, 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 it, it's a it's a difficult game to really analyse as such. Um, all you can analyse is Leinster's attitude. Mm. Mm. Well, I think it started well, when, and that was good. But I think the attitude was epitomised when O'Connor picked the team. He picked eleven Irish internationals, a Springbok, yeah. and four other Irish internationals on on, on the, the bench. bench. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's kind of having to really because you you need to keep these players churning and there's mm. a week off unfortunately this week mm. uh, and there's no rugby on whatsoever <laughs> so we're hardly going to play them in the B&I Cup uh, you know you'd be disappointed if you saw any of the Irish internationals playing in the in, in the B&I Cup so you've got to keep these guys taking over yeah. and I know they've all played a lot of Six Nations and they've also played two hard games in a row uh, with five days in between but you know with a, with a big break like that you got to play at least most of your of your of your big guns just to keep them keep well, the, them running the, the interesting thing is that the the Ospreys game didn't work out in the end but you know in terms of usage of the squad the Ospreys game and the, and the Treviso game together we saw most of if not all of the if you like the first choice if we were if we were heading into a, a Heineken Cup semi-final this weekend which we aren't because there's no rugby on this weekend <laughs> um but if we were um all the guys who would be in the twenty three got a run out over those those two games, which is yeah. which is a positive, you know. Mm. So he has to keep them in that kind of um that frame of mind coming into yeah. the game against Ulster. Uh, and anybody with a hint of a niggle oh, yeah. either <clears throat> didn't play or got dragged off yeah. early. I mean Redden might have a hint of a niggle, he wasn't played, Darcy wasn't played. Uh, and uh, Luke wasn't risked or Well Luke certainly wasn't risked. Uh give him an extra couple of well, weeks. Driscoll was whipped off pretty quick. And uh, uh Isaac Boss disappeared at half time and it, there was a medic looking at him just before he went off I'm sure there isn't a whole lot wrong with him but it was a kind of take no chances don't risk mm. any injuries well if you're in that situation like the situation Leinster are in where they were they had the game won mm-hmm. the other, the opposition didn't look like they were going to make a fantastic comeback by any no. shape or form and well, you have play hard at us for that, for that period they did where yeah we, but they were never actually going to come back into, put no. themselves into position where they were going to win the game or game, even no. threaten to win the game no. and you have young guys on the bench like Luke McGrath then you had a ab- great game. Then you absolutely use them. I thought he had a f- fabulous game as well. Mm-hmm. I, I agree entirely. Um, then it's a, it's 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 all gravy for Matt O'Connor to a certain extent. Coming in the half time, points up, young fellas on the bench that he can use. You know, mm. it's all good. It's all good, well, is right. Well, anyway, we've got a lot of tries to get through, so we might as well kick off and, and look at Murphy's first one. It was a nice uh, a nice way to start. All right. Uh, but Jordy Murphy's had a very good season, you know, and it's nice to see him getting a bit of. When you consider he was B and I at the end of last yeah, season, yeah, look at him now playing for Ireland. <laughs> Woohoo! You could say that about quite a few of the players, yeah, you, really. Mm-hmm. Well, there's been a lot of guys have come through. That's what people forget. We, maybe we'll address it after we look yeah. at the tries. But you know, there have been a lot of young players come through. Nice solid scrum. Solid is right. Yeah. And you can see. Oh, like you said, the passes are sticking. Look at Fangio making yeah. the yards around the corner, like I said. Uh, Everyone making yards. Yeah. It's a good play. Great, great, great hands there from the... Both from second Mike rows, McCarthy. one yeah. to the other. Jeez, and here, uh, Carney, I think it is, p- pitches it back into him. Yeah, it's great you hands know, from Rob Carney. He's, he's having a very great good Great brain season. from Rob yeah. Carney. He is having a good season. Uh, he's shown his all-round footballing ability, really, this year. Yeah, he's, he's in great form. I guess someone like him now, he's kind of, he's transitioned from being, you know, trying to make the breakthrough into the, from the Leinster team into the Irish team now. He's obviously gone on two lines trips and he's now a very senior member of that team. Yeah. You know, he's kind of come right through the, through the ranks, right mm-hmm. to be a, a leader within the team. Absolutely, yeah. You'd hope that, you'd hope that when, 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 when guys are talking together in, in the team setting that he'd be one of the guys doing the talking because... Yeah. I mean, he's one of the more senior players. Mm. I mean, when you think about it, he made his debut back in, what, 2006? 05, oh, 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 five, six. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. You know, that's, you know, that's seven, years, long ago. Time seven ago, eight yeah. years ago when mm. you think about it. It doesn't seem like much as the seasons roll into one another. That's a long time ago. So, mm. 
you know that's that's what you'd hope from a guy it like him. Doesn't seem very long because you're old. That's well, that's true. <laughs> that is true. Um, I am very old. I'm feeling older every day. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> so we look at um, the second second tour now. I think is uh, was Cronin's uh, showed some lovely turn of speed for it. Oh, this is this uh, Cronin. Is Cronin. He, he, I mean, you could actually see the acceleration. The um, hooker that thinks he's a center. <laughs> All hookers think they're centers. At least yep. he's not going for drop goals like no. um, he would used to. <laughs> he hasn't quite gone that far yet. Uh, yeah, brilliant, brilliant uh, turn the pace. And great quick brain as well. Yeah. Look, straight through. Right, I'm gone. See you now. Bye. Like that's 40 metres that he burned everyone. Yeah. He, he did burn a whole lot of backs, wingers, the whole lot. I mean, he is, he is genuinely quick, but the one thing he has... Apart from sometimes being quick is no use because it's no use being quick over 100 meters because the pitch is only 100 meters long. What he has is the ability to get from a stand and start to a stop speed yeah. really quickly. Acceleration is the most important thing, and he really has it. But that's part of the explosive power, it's the same when he's carrying the ball in contact. Mm -hmm. He is, he's fun. He's been great. Uh, it shows the conditioning these guys have as well, you know, it's that they can ratchet it up that quickly. And look at the yeah. bulk on the guy as well to be able to. <laughs> <laughs> if that was an American football player, somebody run on with oxygen for him. <laughs> He's bulk, but there's not much on him, if you know what I mean. Oh yeah, but there's a lot of bulk for. Oh yeah, but it's scrummaging, etc. It's the right kind of bulk. It's not like the oh, old days. Of course, days. no. It's not like uh, what's his name with the long hair that plays for Wales? Hibbert. Hibbert. Yeah. Yeah, he's a bit of an owl belly on him, so he has he's got an Ed Kelly there yeah. for sure. <laughs> so the next one was. Uh was Keen Healy's Keen audacious Healy, yeah. dummy. Yeah. The other centre. The other centre. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you see, your tight head can't really be a centre, so it's only the, the loose yeah. head. And the okay, we call him left winger then. <laughs> Again, it's a good, good play, nice change of direction there. Mm -hmm. um, Reese Ruddock had carried well all day. Uh, he's, good. He's, he's had another, another guy who's had, we'll have to talk Brilliant about later season. who's had a breakthrough season yeah. in a way. Again, like lovely offloading and, mm -hmm. you know, Backs and forwards, keeping yeah. the interacting. ball alive. Healy just got this ball and he went, these guys are not stopping me. Uh, I'll do a dummy. I mean, and to then. a certain extent, he did. I mean, from that distance, Keane Healy doesn't need a dummy. <laughs> I mean, he can just barrel over. I mean, he is um, a disappointment of the Lions tour. He's put it behind him to really mature this season. I don't think there's any questions. He's the best loose head uh, prop in the world. I don't think there can really be any question of it. He's up there. He's got to be. He just be. scores a ferocious amount of tries for a prop. I mean, He's, you know, back when, when you can I do that. He, scores when I played, he scores a ferocious amount of tries for any kind of fault. He does, he does, but like back <laughs> when I played, if you cut the ball, if you touch the ball three times in a game, you're doing well. You mm -hmm. know, when he's getting tries every second game. <laughs> if I touched the ball three times in a season, I was doing well and Will, something wrong. <laughs> Willie John McBride actually, I uh, remember a famous uh, game where they, they, they had the camera on him for the whole game and he didn't touch the ball <laughs> once, not even in the line out. Uh, so, you know, and look, that guy was a legend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, you know? Well, this one, Kirshner's try was the one we got the bonus for after 25 minutes. Mm. So, yeah. But this one, which when we rolled it on, like I thought, Godbert had a fine game, and because he was standing so much flatter, it was closer yeah, to yeah, the game yeah, line exactly. Made, that's and if exactly he had just it. played that way against Treviso, or sorry, against um, against Toulon, you know, it's such a pity that he would have had a better chance. So yeah. Made a huge difference. Well, he was hugely undercooked against Toulon. Because he does have a nice break. I mean, he's got good skill. Like you, like you said at the beginning of the season, all those Kiwis have good skills, you know. And yeah. he does have. He's a nice step, good burst, and he he he, he passes well mm. out of the tackle. Good basics. Yeah. They all have it. Even, even the a, rubbish ones. Kershaw takes a nice line here, actually. He does. And, you know, showing no ill effect to the uh, clash in the air. No. Copper's break. But he had a good bit to do after, yeah. you know, okay. Slight comedy tackling from number 11 there. Uh He's a big guy, though, Kershner. He is. I don't think people realise just like, I mean, he is physically, he's a big guy. 95 yeah. kilos and there's, you know, none of it is uh, is Richard Hibbert. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Pints of brains. Yeah. <laughs> now I like a pint of brain myself, but... Uh. So then we, obviously, we mentioned earlier, we had to wait uh, a good 20-odd 20, uh, 20 minutes for, mm. for the next try. Gave people a chance to go to the bar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but well, um, when it came... Tom Ryan came on and and uh, he got his try. This is the one off the line out uh, with. Uh, no, it's not the one I was thinking of actually. No, this is just a nice mall and yeah, 
clever, clever come at, uh, So many tries, you're not know, confusing yeah. them all. <laughs> It was good marshalling by, by uh, Luke McGrath. Yeah, he kept yeah. telling his pack where he wanted and where he wanted. There is serious comedy tackling here, though. They're just like, look when he runs over for the try. Who's there? No one. Yeah. They're just standing there looking at him. You know, that. At, at, at a certain point, you can, you can tell when a team is just, you know, it's, play, it's playing by numbers. You know, it's like, oh, there's a mall. I think I should just amble over and stand here. But I'm the, the pillar. There was one guy out slightly wide and there was three guys in. And look, you can see it now in a sec. There's one guy just standing there who just gets caught yeah. flat-footed, and the rest of them are just standing behind them. Yeah, the other, lo- the other lock, the number four just ambles out of the path. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's not really, they're, they're not really get, killing themselves at this stage. I bet you he's delighted Joe Schmidt doesn't work for Treviso because yeah. he'd <laughs> get out of murdering yeah. on Monday morning. Yeah, still, Reiner had to do the work there. Oh and yeah, he did. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's all very well the guy not being there, but somebody had somebody from a Leinster in a Leinster jersey has to go over, you know, and and and, and he did. Mm-hmm. So I think it's our sixth try. Then came from my man of the match, which was Noel Reed. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I think that I think possibly the break from this is the one I think from the line at the yeah. break from the uh, uh, McGrath was yeah. absolutely fantastic. Yeah. He just had a bit of presence of mind, and he dummied and he handed off. Uh, I didn't see who he handed off, but it was. It's actually. I'm actually very do, sweet. Reed's second try is the one that well, was the try of the game, but uh, I didn't know. No, you're you're quite correct. Um, Luke McGrath was superb for this try. It was a real, it's classic scrum half snipe. Really was, yeah. yeah. Mm. I I didn't see who it was, but if you see it, he just he just you can see his brain working in a split second. He goes, hold on, I won't. I'll hand that guy off and I'll run. Yeah. And of course, perfectly weighted pass. And Reed had a little bit to do, you know, for a guy who. A season ago was a little bit insubstantial. He's put on a bit of bulk. He has, he, yeah. And yeah. he can run through fellas as well as around them now, you know. But again, for for a lot of these guys, I mean... That was a fair to, dunt he gave your yeah, man to get him out of the way. They have know? to grow into their physiques. Mm. You know, it was, it was the same, like we were talking about Reese Rullock last year, had, that he hadn't grown into his body, but this year he has. And, you know, these guys do. I mean, he's, he's grown into several persons' know, bodies at this but stage. But he's, he's still, I mean, no, Reed is, what, 23, 24? Mm-hmm. I mean, he's still one of the young guys in the yeah. squad. But he's getting a bit of consistent game time now. Yeah. He played last weekend. He played against Munster A in the B&I match. Mm-hmm. And you know, in both those games, he had a fine game, and I thought he was superb on uh, on Friday oh, he was. night. I mean, he's been he's had a lot of game time this year, and you can see it. You can see the benefit to him, and he's been excellent all year. I mean, we've seen flashes of him in the in the over the last we say two or three years, things mm-hmm. that he could do, breaks and stuff like that. But this year, he's put he's put the whole lot together with uh, his a increased bit of his increased physicality. He's meant he's a, he's a much better defender as well, mm-hmm. and. You know, that was his big weakness, yeah, but it, it he's makes, really addressed it now. Yeah. Whatever about the worries about who's going to play at 13, that Reed's form kind of eases whatever. It, it a, gives a Connor an option. Yeah. You know, yeah. like he mightn't be the finished article, but really what, what players are at 22 no, 23? No. Mm-hmm. And plus, I think it's his first season out of the academy. Am I, am I right? Uh, you may or may not be. I don't know. Uh, so it's cer- certainly not more than a second. Yeah, so he's up then. Uh, we started really turning the screw down in the last 10 minutes with he's up's try. Mm-hmm. Yeah, again, again, it was it was, it was good play, good play from McGrath again, linking things up nicely, you know. Yeah, three tries in the last yeah. ten minutes. Uh, I don't think Jamie had a massive amount to do there. Look at fa- <laughs> Fanning at the skittles yeah. again. Fanning, Fan Joe did all the work. Yeah, like he had one tackle to break, and he was just cruising. See, uh, they yeah. were down a man, so numbers could have counted yeah. then. But he's up on the outside. I mean, you have a man that size move. Who? I mean, he's lips quick. Mm-hmm. We were talking quick about quick and big. He's, and uh, yeah. break tackles. A guy that and, you know, a guy that big can can shift fairly quickly. And if you're if you're not really feeling like it, you're going to get out of his way, or mm-hmm. or, or, or you know, give, <clears throat> get, make a short wiper of a of a tackle yeah. rather than the real one. I think Treviso just wanted this game to be over. Well, they they did, yeah. the home. Sucking themselves into the shower they were at that stage, but. Uh, even the tackle that did go in wasn't. I mean, the the attempt was from Campanara, who I was massively disappointed with because I was really looking forward to yeah, seeing him in action. Yeah, after Six Nations. Yeah, McLean was was a lot better. I, yeah, he, he showed up reasonably well, but you know, the other guy. Yeah. yeah, he was the, he was he was like trying. He was King Canute trying to stop the tide. So he was. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, well done, Jamie. Capped off, I, you know. I I I would have said fair enough. Finally got man of the match, but I would have said he slip or read. Probably deserved it. Yeah, slightly more. And we look at Luke McGrath, and I thought, I thought when he came on, like he had a good forty minutes. He did, he did, he did everything you'd want him to do in that situation. You know, he played, he played really well. He deserved his, his, his try too. Good, he got, he got everyone moving. He uh, great. Fo- look great, where he was. 
Great scrum Run. half play there, shadow in the ball carrier. Yeah, I mean, that's the what right you want, spot, you know. Yeah. But I think you know. Didn't make a meal of it either. Nope. They've kind of earmarked him now to be Redden's successor or Boss's successor. Certainly, if not next season, the following season. But he certainly looks to be in pole position between himself and Cooney at this yeah. point. Um, mm. It's hard to know if Cooney's is he injured? Is he? I was sitting in the stand yeah. there. I saw him in the Lo- uh, lots of guys sitting on the stand coverage. <laughs> well, no, of course. Sorry, I didn't mean that to mean that he's not injured or he is injured, but. Uh, they they're kind of they they both have a slight flaws in their game. Cooney's has always been his decision making, but the f- bits he's had this season, he's actually seems to have improved decision making. Luke t- McGrath has been his pass, and that seems to have it's not it's not exactly Madigan type crisp. It's not it wouldn't hit you in the chest or you know, but it's, it's not supposed to hit you in the chest. It's it's uh, <laughs> well, what I mean is it doesn't it if it knock you down. Chest, it's a bad pass. It, it, it wouldn't <laughs> knock you down, and it wouldn't uh, get. It's not very fast pass yet but it's certainly improved you know you can it's see the ball just when the ball flies out from you know it doesn't spin in a yeah, in I'm Peter Stringer like it's yeah, not I, Peter I, Stringer I, I'm like, not no. I'm not as big a devotee of the theory that the pass from a scrum half has to be immensely fast it has to be functional mm. scrum half's most important role is his decision, decision making, making um, that guy has great yeah, decision making uh, for a young guy although you don't want to make Bradley type pass no you don't, you don't want to you make either, where every second ball was at the toe no, you, you, you don't, you don't want to make Bradley pass but you know to be honest with you the current Irish obsession with the pass scrum half was basically the media trying to justify Stringer's selection for the Irish team for over 10 years that's what it's all about. <laughs> Everybody said, I mean, you look, na- name okay, the best Dave. five scrum halves in the world over the last 10 years. Did any of them have a pass anywhere near as good as Stringers? No, none of them did. They, did them, they, did, they had other elements of their exactly, game. Exactly, but there are other elements but, to the game. But of course. what Stringer did excellently was his pass. And, and that's all he did. And that's all he did, of course. But, but you did if it so you, well. If you could blend Stringer into Rob Howley and... Gregan and you know Marshall you'd have a Robocop that would be just the best player in the but world over the course of Peter Stringer's career there were only two scrum halves from the home nations who didn't make a Lions tour him and Guy Easterby and there's reasons for that I mean you look at George Gregan you look at Jus van der Vesthuizen you look at Justin Marshall you look at none of those guys had extraordinary passes they could actually play football which mm-hmm. you know Stringer, Stringer was a one trick pony now he did that trick really really well but it was a one-trick pony. And because of that, we obsess about the pass because that's what we've been told over the last 10 years. Mm. Scrum half has to pass, scrum half has to pass. <clears throat> he doesn't. He has to have a functional pass. What a scrum half has to do is get, guide his team around the pitch. Yep. You look at you look at Pienaar. Pienaar doesn't have a great pass. But is there any better scrum half in the Northern Hemisphere when he's on song? Yeah. No? Mm-hmm. Even though he's not from the Northern Hemisphere. No, but in the, <laughs> Most in certainly the in it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean that's that's the thing. I mean it's all about it's all about being the what was the French used to call the scrum halves? Petit general. The petit general. That's the thing. Yeah. So anyway, we look at Reed's last try, and I thought this was I thought epitom- this was epitomized Leinster in this game. Yeah. Still, we were in our twenty-two. We we're still willing to. Uh, we want to go for the eighty look, minutes. Eighty minutes on the clock. It's actually time is up, but we want another try. But there's there's great interchange between um, Heeslip and between Heeslip and yeah. uh, Reed. Great play from Goppert, first of all. But this is great. Reed is gone. Yeah. Heeslip is in the right place, but look the way he drops back just yeah. the right amount, and he just shadows the man perfectly to take the pass. That would be back. so simple to butcher. Oh yeah, as we but almost exactly. did against T- Toulouse back in 06. Yeah, yeah that's true. You know, like a two it's on so one like simple. That. But it's like you just said, it's so simple to get wrong. You know, mm-hmm. uh, and. It, that's see the way he just slowed his just slightly mm-hmm. and he got it perfect. Yeah, he held his depth very well. Perfect. So, you know. Well done guys. And look, Jamie he's still full and running, just shows you how fit the guy is. <laughs> yeah, the guy's a monster. Out in the out in the backs, full of running on eighty minutes. I'd love so many minutes of rugby he's played he, this season. He plays eighty minutes every game. Isn't it? Yeah, every did, did I read somewhere he, re- he played every minute of the Six Nations too? Yeah, he did. He did. Yeah. Every single. I think he was the only one mm. in the whole of our, the Irish team. Oh, he's an absolute beast. He's, he's extraordinarily fit. He's, yeah. mm-hmm. he was at a he was at a thing in my work there a few weeks ago from doing you know, a maxi muscle, and uh, the physique on him was it's just phenomenal. Did yeah. you, you have a little moment? Did you? I did, yeah. <laughs> a little moment in your pants. Well, no, 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 no. It brought a tear to my eye, Dave. <laughs> Which one? I used to be. <laughs> Matron. Right, so anyway, the bonus point, the bonus point victory, uh, victory keeps us six points clear of Munster. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're on seventy-four points. 
especially after Munster got their uh, victory over over Connacht at the weekend, which I watched that match and I felt so sorry for Connacht, like they they just didn't get any rub of the green. They didn't no, but they they played a little bit dumb rugby. They played rugby. better than they, 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 had better than they have. Yeah. In fairness. But it's a good thing you didn't see last week's episode for Connacht fans. <laughs> mm, yeah, uh, Connacht got a bit of a roasting last week. I think maybe that's why we had technical problems, <laughs> Dave. You know, it was God punishing <laughs> you for giving out about Connacht. Well, one thing we didn't mention, well, we mentioned last week, but we haven't today, was uh, Connacht's new signing at centre. And yeah. it was interesting, I heard Bernard Jackman been uh, interviewed and he was saying he is the best yeah. available centre because presumably. He's gone looking. Jackman's gone looking in the market, and yeah. he said he's the best available. Well, he would uh, have gone looking, seeing he's going to be a head coach, and he also, I think, said that Leinster and Munster were both in from, but he's gone to Connacht. Mm. Possibly a lot to do with Pat Lamb. But uh, I wonder though if that's some also sort of, an extra few quid. But I wonder if that's a payoff for Henshaw. Possibly, I know the, I know Peter, uh, Peter Brown. Uh, uh, oh sorry, uh, Philip Brown has come out and said no, that he won't move. But the uh, he didn't actually say that. Yeah, but the, the, the he said he won't be forced to move. Yeah. Forced so to move. did but, Joe Schmidt. But then the CEO, or sorry, the president of the IRFU, kind of hinted that he would. But he I might. wonder if it's a playoff that we'll got we'll buy you this very very exciting centre from New Zealand, mm-hmm. but Henshaw has to go. I think there's an element. There's there's certainly an element to that to it. I think, but I think there's also an element that the IRFU are targeting the second Welsh team. Um. In the, and what they want to do is they want to upskill Get Connacht four. enough or up finance Connacht enough that they can challenge for four mm-hmm. Irish places yeah, in yeah. the in the in the whatever the hell they're going to call a cup. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that's I think there's what you say is valid, but I think there's also an element that the IRFU have decided that Wales need to be punished for their behaviour over the last six <laughs> months, and Connacht are going to be the rod that they beat them with. Mm, that'd be nice over the knee. Yeah. Mm. So, uh, and the, uh, the other game of note, I suppose, of the weekend was Ulster's uh, thumping at the hands yeah. of, of Glasgow. Glasgow are really cruising there. 27 really, 9, and I yeah. watched that match on Friday after yeah. Lenser's in. It was tight enough at the fir- you know, in the first half, but once Glasgow got motoring, they were, mm. they were flying. And Gla- Glasgow took what they did to Ulster and did it to improved Ulster. Improved on and it. Improved on it and did it mm. to Ulster again. I mean, there was that one dodgy try that even the try score didn't believe was yeah. scored. <laughs> but I'm telling you, that wasn't the winning or losing of that game. No, the game was over that season. Uh, we, we, we said it two weeks ago. We said it after the Munster, after Glasgow beat Munster. Actually, we didn't, we, you didn't see it because it was last week. But that Townsend has, has brought... A very, uh, Glasgow are quite an innovative team. I mean, they play fairly simple rugby, but they do it in an innovative manner. Mm-hmm. Um, he uses the players they have very, very well. He's got obviously he's moving Vernon around the place. They they don't commit to malls at line out, so they can so there's no offside line. They can come around the side and yeah. with with impunity. They have a um, good spirit as well. They, like they, really... they seem to have a very good team spirit. Mm. Important players are beginning to play well for them as well. Like Maitland, Maitland in the last yeah. two matches has been superb. I mean, he took Simon Zebo to the absolute cleaners last week, mm-hmm. and you know the Ulster wingers didn't exactly kill him either. And on on top of that, they have like they didn't start Matawalu. No. Carlin Isles hasn't come into the squad yet, no. so they have a bit of strength in depth as well. A few I, secret weapons for the playoffs. Maybe? Chris Cusseter has seemed to recover some of the form from maybe five or six years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, he's playing really well. Still think they're a bit iffy at out half, but you know they've he's functional. Hodge is functional, and they've enough players around them. They've also have got Rory Jackson as well if they need him. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I thought he was Edinburgh. So they've 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 got those players well, there. They <clears> they they've, they've good squad. I mean Johnny Gray is beginning to grow into himself. You know they're, they're looking decent. Johnny then. Gray is a great player. Yeah, he's really yeah but like, but he, this year. like last year he looked like a guy who was a year too young. This year, like we were saying about, Reece, <laughs> I'm getting very excited. Like we were saying about Reece Ruddock, like we were saying about. Uh, well, he's certainly no, grown Reed. into his body. He's as doing well, the same uh, thing as Johnny well. Gray. So they're they're going to be a very dangerous team come the playoffs, mm-hmm. and I don't think yeah. there's any question that they're going to make the playoffs. Uh, they're going to get a home playoff. Yeah, I'd, but, I'd stake my <laughs> reputation on that. That's not much. Not much. But, no. but Glasgow have really <laughs> seemed to, to lose. <laughs> but they seem to have got it right. You know, they play in the right size stadium. They mm-hmm. moved out of the football yeah. ground to their own identity in, yeah. in Scott's mm-hmm. tune. And yeah. you know, if they can, if they can manage to get planning permission to keep those temporary stands up around the running track, mm-hmm. then they've got a nice capacity. I mean, I was looking at the at the at the crowd at the match. I mean, there must have been. You know, eight, ten thousand. It was the their game. biggest like, crowd of the year. Well, the the, think, the yeah. game against, games against Ulster are always big crowds oh, for are, Scottish yeah. teams because there's so many people from from Northern Ireland. Ulster people there, yeah. But still, yeah. there's Scotland. an indigenous uh, Scottish oh, yeah. crowd starting yeah. to, or Glaswegian crowd starting to come to the matches now. Uh, yeah. it, to a certain extent, it's a case of if if you build it, they will come, and that's mm. what happened. I mean, we've always said about Edinburgh, get the hell out of Murrayfield because it's very mm-hmm. hard to build any kind of a a lo- uh, You can't mm. make a game an event 
if it's in played in a soulless a normal dome but then now, again Murrayfield is great when it's full but when it's empty yeah, but it's if you, even if there was 30,000 there's still yeah, half empty that's you know? the problem with it Mega Deathland is, is a bit too small though it's yeah. gone too far the other way it possibly is but that was a temporary thing I think that they could find a happy medium maybe looking at one of the, maybe doing a deal with you know Hearts or Hibs or something you know Glasgow have done the right thing they've They've got the right ground. I mean, Fir Hill was the wrong ground because it was a football ground. It wasn't big enough for the mm. for the, me, the ambition of the team. They were limited in the kind of rugby they could play. Yeah. Um, whereas now they've got good facilities. They've got a good pitch, and they're beginning to build a real mm. real attendance. Mm. Well, you know, Munster are obviously distracted mm. with their their Heineken Cup. Uh, There's no rugby this weekend. Their Heineken Cup that isn't happening this weekend. Uh, that's been suspended in Dave's reality distortion mm-hmm. field. Mm-hmm. Um, I declare my own reality. <laughs> uh, I think too too many years of being into Steve Jobs has, has <laughs> made you yeah. be also able to dis- distort reality. Um, if I could do it as well as him, I'd be off on my yacht, not talking to you losers. <laughs> uh, but yeah, my, I reckon that is going to put Glasgow in a, in a home semi because Ulster are in trouble. Uh, look there's at the, so look, many people look at their injured fixtures. now. They've got Leinster at home. They've got Munster away. Mm-hmm. You know, two very tough games. Mm-hmm. Glasgow, on the other hand, have got Edinburgh at home. And they've both got, Italian sides. And both Italians. Uh, one Italian side at home and one away. you got to give... And the one that's away, that's, we just hockeyed 62-7. Yeah, you, 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 you got to be guessing you know. that's three The wins. other side of that yeah. for Ulster is that they might be looking at it and going, well, Leinster are a bit... You know, they're not playing great this year. We have a chance there. Munster, when they play Munster, there could be a case of Best to look with that, either after the Lord Mayor's show or before the Lord Mayor's show. Mm-hmm. You know, so they might be catch, hoping to catch them on the hop there. I wouldn't be quite so confident that it's as bleak as we think it is for for uh, Ulster. To a certain extent, as far as the Ulster-Leinster game is concerned, I hope it is as bleak mm-hmm. as, as they think. But it mightn't be. I mean, they still have a very good team. I mean, I'd, okay, they've got some injuries that may or may not resolve themselves. I'd like to see uh, them in the playoffs ahead of the Ospreys, because uh, that's what will happen. If Ulster lose both games, the Ospreys will sneak back into fourth place. Mm-hmm. Uh, Munster look glued into third place. And uh, Glasgow, I reckon, for second, and us, us to top the... Uh, I mean, we, uh, by the time the games come around, we might only need four. Po- even if we lost in U- in Ulster, we might only need four points of Edinburgh. The way the bonus points will go, uh, but I think we should be looking to go up to Ulster and tear them out of it. Yeah, I, not because we need the points, because we don't, but just I think we need the performance. Get, we for, need the for, performance for to get into <coughs> the playoffs with decent performances behind us. We can't go up and kind of half commit to the game or you go oh well we don't really need the win we give it 97 and a half percent you know can't go in with that attitude because it'll be damaging not on the on the score or on the the match points table but on the psychological side of it i think it'll be damaging and it's not like to save ourselves for anything you know we've got a a rest the weekend of the you know uh, next the weekend of no rugby Mm. uh, and then we might have another by the irb declared international no rugby weekend if if we're good enough to beat uh, it's the first time since april 08 that we haven't haven't had it in a european semi-final yeah Mm. it it, 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 i'll joke aside it is it it is kind of a a, an extraordinary run of run of success that we've had um that's the way all good things come to an end and I, I mean, I mean, that's it. I mean, we're, the team is in it, and it might be a time to. We were talking about talking about young players. It might be time to to start going into that. I mean, there is there's a core of the team that have been together. We say since two thousand and five, two thousand and six, mm-hmm. um, that have kind of some are right at maturity level, like Rob Carney, like Jamie Heaslip. Some are beginning to slip over the edge. Uh, like Brian, obviously, is retiring. Leo's retiring. Gordon Darts is coming close to retirement. Geno, Geno, Redden and Boss. But then that's offset by the fact that there's a huge number of really bright prospects coming through. We've Jack McGrath coming through this year, mm-hmm. Marty Moore, uh, Devin Toner's really s- set forward as an international lock this year. Yeah, Reese Ruddock, Jordy Murphy has uh, has played very well. Then you've got No Reed coming through, and there's there's guys like that. So what 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 has happened to Leinster this year is it's actually a team that's kind of going in two directions at yeah. once, as it were. Uh, and it hasn't quite met in the middle. Maybe it met in the middle last year. It hasn't quite met in the middle this year. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the future, people are thinking, oh, it's, it's doom and gloom and the coach must go mm. and blah, 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 blah. Well, there has been lots of debate and discussion about O'Connor. Mm-hmm. And, you know, From idiots. <laughs> well, I mean, I think some of their arguments... a mixed bag I, of I, I knowledgeable think, and not so knowledgeable No, I think people. some of their arguments are valid. But if you look at the facts, like I was just looking at it, compared to season to last season, for example, 
we're, we're top of the league. We're leading by six at the moment. We've won 15 and drawn one. We've got 74 points and scored 12 bonus points. At the end of the season last year, we played 22 games. We won 17. So we're two behind where we were last year. If this but, is a rebuilding season... we lost five. Bring so it we've up. We've only lost four this season. We've scored 78 points compared to 74 at the moment. And we've got 10, point, we've got 10 points and bonuses. Um, and we only scraped through the semi-final of the Pro 12... 17-15 mm, yeah, yeah. against Glasgow yeah. last season and then obviously we had a very tough game against Ulster but you know we won the league based on um, the final being played in Dublin Like I, I based on Robbie Dyack not being able to get the ball then <laughs> <laughs> maybe so as well yeah but like you know that match could have if it hadn't been Belfast you know it might have been a different result yeah. then you look at the European campaign like we topped our pool this season we won 5 out of 6 games in the pool last season we, we only won 4 out of the 6 and you might argue that last season's pool was actually weaker admittedly Claremont were in it but the other two teams Scarlets and Exeter I would argue that um, if you look at this team you had the French champions uh, cast you had the English runners up Northampton and you had our bogey team Ospreys in, in our pool and we still came out on top mm-hmm. now you know obviously we because we didn't come out of the pool we got to one the dropped pass away from winning all our games pretty much you know uh, the last minute you know, we did oh, we you know, if we hadn't conceded that try at the end against Northampton that's what I'm saying yeah, we, yeah. Di- we didn't deserve to win that game in fairness but we were on the line mm-hmm. and if that pass had gone to a man rather than hitting the deck and being intercepted we could have stolen it would have mm-hmm. been burglary and yeah. we wouldn't have deserved it but you know we, the record books would say we the, very the, harsh our group. the big difference is that had a home semi, a if, home you look, if you look at the players that were available last season the players that are available this season mm-hmm. I mean it's a huge difference. I mean, mm-hmm. we've lost Johnny Sexton, and people can say, "Oh, well, you, that's an excuse." It's a huge. I mean, the best out half in the northern, the northern hemisphere, hemisphere yeah. is gone without question. The best coach, in the best possibly winger. the world, the best coach, the best wing slash utility back. That you know, when people talk about the great foreign signings Leinster have signed, you know, Eason Asiwa would be at least second at least in number one at least he'd certainly be number one on my list but he'd be at least second in everyone's but list he's not a vine with and yeah. you know I'd say you mm-hmm. look at the guy who, who was the if you like the breakthrough star of the Lions tour Sean O'Brien out for a vast amount of the season yeah. and these aren't easy replacements to, these aren't easy, on top of which you have in a fact new, he, was, he was out from the Northampton game that we won to the mm-hmm. Northampton game that we lost the difference was we didn't have Sean O'Brien yeah. Yeah. On top of that, you have a new coach coming in, who's come in after the signing window has closed, if you like. So he hasn't been able to put his own stamp on the team. Mm-hmm. And plus, he's got to follow the Beatles, you know. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. That's it. He has to follow the Beatles. I mean, Joe Schmidt is the greatest coach that Leinster has ever had. He'll probably end up being the greatest coach Ireland has ever had, and indeed the Lions, I'd say. And and Matt O'Connor has to follow that act. And mm-hmm. I think people are judging them too harshly. Mm-hmm. I know some people, people are, it's quite right to express concerns about how Leinster are playing. Because there are vast he hasn't been league. perfect. He's no. mismanaged a couple of things. Like he's, he's, mis, he's mismanaged the, the out half question. And start. we haven't played very well. There's no, there's no coherent. You, if you're looking at Leinster, you couldn't say, this is how Leinster play, the way you could under Schmidt, the way you could even under Checker. But again, right? give the guy five minutes to yeah. get, a, get a season together, you know. Yeah, I think there's, there's this fine balance between encouraging your players to play and attacking brand of rugby and you know trying to play on the game line which he hasn't done specifically the match down in too long mm-hmm. and then for guys to drop passes and knock them on and throw the ball you know four meters too long in the well, line out p- that, are, that's a that's a player error of course and it but people are blaming if, that on him not exactly. doing as many drills as as joe Schmidt, well look which well look if you think back if you think back well, to the match in claremont that is because they selectively well, on. read one interview and decided to take their own interpretation out of it that's not what actually he was said in that interview what was said in the interview was that uh joe schmidt liked to do all the drills very intensively all at once and then did a discussion off the pitch Whereas O'Connor prefers to do the drills and, and then discuss them on the pitch, on right. the training pitch. Mm-hmm. So, but people decided that that meant that Matt O'Connor isn't doing any training. Mm. Yeah, but like if you think back to the match against Claremont in Claremont last season, you know yeah. our line out misfunctioned, and if we had have got those, we possibly could, could have, have won, won the, the game. game. Yeah, at we least didn't. Drawn it. it didn't work, and we lost. Mm-hmm. Same thing happened in Toulon. It didn't, and there was very little criticism of Schmidt. And I think, as you said, Dave, there is so much harsh criticism of O'Connor this season. Like yes, he hasn't got everything perfect, and he certainly mismanaged the out the out half situation. And I don't know whether he's getting pressure from the IRFU to pick Madigan in Pro Twelve games, and he he can have his own free choice to play 
who he wants to play it out half yeah, I don't think, in Heineken. I don't think that's the case. I, I think he hinted at that. I think to a certain extent that, you know, whisper it, but Madigan's been shit this year. Well, <laughs> I mean, any time he's... He hasn't He played, hasn't had a good season. He, he hasn't had a good season. And, and but, now, to say that Jimmy Goppers has, you know, dropped a few dookies on the pitch in, himself has. in his time. So it's not as if but, one of them... So the reason why... If one of them were to stand up and make a definitive statement in terms of how they played in a particular match and play really well, really well, I would suggest that Matt O'Connor would pick them. But what he's have, what well, he picked them, in a recurring basis. But what's happened is neither player has, you know, suggested has put their hand up no, for the jersey as they say. But there's a couple of things. There's a couple of things, right? Uh, there, there, there's not a whole lot to choose between them no. this season. Okay, but Madigan is Irish qualified which is you know the IRFU basically run the provinces for their own benefit allegedly um, J- uh, Jimmy Goppert is almost 31 years of age he ain't getting any better now he's bloody good but he's not gonna he's not absolute world class and you know there's a chance that Madigan may in two or three years or whatever amount of years time maybe even one year be world class uh so there's, I think I said this last week, so we might have lost it in the uh, <coughs> kerfuffle. Kerfuffle, but uh, there, there, there was a time when Madigan needed a bit of an arm around the shoulder and a, f- a run of games rather than a kick in the hole. Uh, and you know, there, there were only a couple of games that I would uh, when I would have said, look, just back him, back mm. him for a few weeks and he, give him. And give he him was run. unfortunate well, at the start of the season other, because the when he was sorry, when he was coming on, he was often coming on. Because someone got in, like he was supposed to come yeah, on, and to play come on half in different whatever, positions, yeah, yeah. at out half. But he was coming on when I don't know Lottie Dakiri got injured against who was it? Plus, Jimmy Gobert got a run on him at the beginning when he was on player rest, yeah. you know, and, 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 and performed very well. The other side is point. Madigan was on had no pressure last week, last year, mm-hmm. right? Because there was a large Johnny Sexton shaped safety net, a big safety blanket, you know? yeah. So he knew that you know I can Johnny Sexton's injured, I can play, 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 play. But if things go wrong wrong when Johnny's fit he'll come back in so that's okay there's no pressure on me mm-hmm. this year there was pressure on him there was the expectation of pretty much every Leinster fan myself included that at the beginning of the season that jo- that Ian Madigan was going to be the was going to be Leinster's out half mm. Goppert was there mm-hmm. for finish international the games and yeah, international uh, windows finish games off etc 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 steady and, the ship yeah, basically Madigan didn't respond to that pressure mm. he didn't respond well I mean he was selected for our first big game of the season Munster. down in, down in Munster didn't play well. No one did that. No, 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 no one did. But you know, he's the he's the guy who's supposed to lead the rest forward. He is le grand general, as they say in France. Yeah. And then, okay, he went he went to Northampton. He played well, but you know, it, it kind of the wheel fell off the wagon after that. Yeah. Um, and then it's been one week one, one week the other. Every I think time they're both playing each other off the pitch. You know what I mean? They're both neither they're, of them is they're both grabbing themselves off yeah, the pitch. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree with you. I mean, uh, and and then the worst part, probably part of it all was. Maybe maybe he was giving him a bit of time to, to get a run of games up to the Heine, the last Heineken Cup, but then he has to play Goppert because he decides maybe it, it looked like at the last minute he decided that, that Madigan wasn't gonna get the gig in Toulon, uh, and he had to bring Goppert on, on to start after having no. I know that seemed I mean, ridiculous. That, that was situation. bizarre. Like you know, as as you say, Dave, neither of them have put their hand up and say, "Pick me, pick me." But at least but if you're going to play a guy, the coach has to make a stand but as if, well. But if you're if you're if you give one guy a start for three games in a row, and you're a fella sitting at home, like mm. um, Copper didn't Copper didn't come on against Munster, like no, you know, and he got eight from, minutes to, against Ebre. So he's going before. to be undercooked. Well, mm-hmm. I, I've I've a feeling that the the Gopper selection against Toulon was informed by the fact that Johnny Wilkinson was going to start for Toulon. And that with mm. Johnny Wilkinson starting for Toulon, they were going to play a very structured game, and that Leinster were going to counter that. Then Johnny Wilkinson went off injured. Uh, Matt Cato went into out half, who's a much, a, a much more rounded player, and, <clears throat> and meant that Toulon were able to play a much more rounded game. And Gopper got caught in the headlights. Yeah. Um, but the problem is he got you, caught you, way behind the game you line. See, there's, <laughs> there's the, re- the the problems that are out half have you know, there are four reasons for it. Ian Madigan, Jimmy Gopper. Matt O'Connor and the absent Johnny Sexton and that's that's what it comes down to mm, um, fair enough ev- everyone there's plenty of, I don't want to use the blame but there's plenty of responsibility to go around mm-hmm. for all, for everyone concerned except maybe Johnny because he's not here but you know um, the three of them have plenty of responsibility to take for the situation that we have at out half 
And, you know, it's getting to the situation where, you know, maybe it's best to just sign somebody in. Mm. Oh, I don't know. Uh, I'd be, I'd be reluctant. We might go the market for the positions first. Yeah. Yeah, we need a second row and we need possibly a centre. Yeah. Oh, um, no, we certainly need those. I mean, mm. uh, there's no question of that, but, you know. Well, we shall see. But anyway, obviously, while there is no other rugby on this weekend in the Heineken Cup, there is the B&I uh, to look forward to. <laughs> so Ponty are playing uh, Leinster in, yes, in the Sardis Road. The IRB had an exception that this game could be played <laughs> on the international weekend of no rugby. <laughs> but you wonder, like, with no game for the first 15 this weekend, if many of the peripheral first-teamers will be available for selection. I, I would be disappointed if anybody who is real first teamer is uh, is going to get a, a go in this I think I mean, like no read it's, it's a bit oh yeah no yeah, read well, but no, read, no, no read has it, played it has been yeah, in and yeah, out yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Dominic Ryan has played B&I uh, Jordy Murphy Denton maybe. has played B&I Jordy Murphy has played B&I uh, possibly mm-hmm. not Jordy Murphy but the rest Quinn of them Rue. Quinn Rue definitely yeah. uh, all of those guys I can see getting a run and you know if we get our tactics right Bonte are not that, I mean, they had a good game by all accounts against um, Cornish Pirates, Cornish Pirates right. down in. They brought down <coughs> 2,000 fans with them. Allegedly, 2,000 fans mm-hmm. went along, but I don't think there's going to be 2,000 Leinster fans over there uh, yeah. in Ponty. There might be two. <laughs> um, <coughs> and if the flights drop, we might even go. Uh, but they've gone a bit dear now. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it'd be great to get to the uh, f- final of that uh, because it's probably going to be Bristol in the other semi-final that will come through it uh, and a couple of our players are going to Bristol and they are a couple of guys who play B and I Cup rugby mm. for us wouldn't it be <laughs> interesting to mm. give them a, a lash against our future uh, uh, team but in, I think the, it was also in the final like should we both make a it? bigger picture about the B and I Cup like it, it's a perfect opportunity for kids that are coming through the academy mm-hmm. to put themselves in the marketplace because it's, obviously there's a limited number of positions available mm-hmm. to play first team rugby in Ireland or in Leinster certainly but in Ireland as well so they do kind of have to say well I'm going to be a professional rugby player and I need to play some games yeah. I can't continue leapfrogging between playing for Old Belvedere one week and an mm-hmm. A game so it gives them like the guys it you're puts, talking about put, the biggest problem that in hi- historically there had always been is below the senior team there was no organised competition and the B&I Cup has filled that Yeah, um, it's provided an organised well. competition and filled it very well um, I mean for young players, say say for example the young props coming up against you know some of the the gnarly guys who play in the English national one and two who've been who are forty but have been propping since you know yeah since the days of Victoria know every single trick in the book that's a great but they're about as fit as oh yeah they're as fit as, fit as you or I but but their 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 knowledge and that's a great learning experience for young players and that's what the British, who was it that, that was uh, John Wells John, no John Dawes is John it? Dawes sorry John Dawes. Um, a great learning experience for, for, for young players, you know. I'd say whoever the prop was that day was bent in two for Oh, I'd say so, yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's, a, that's what you have to learn. I mean, if you, when, when, when Tom Court was signed by Ulster, where, what, where did they send him? They sent him off to National One to learn how to scrummage. You know, they sent him off to, where was it, Rosalind they sent him? Or, uh, Rotherham, uh, one, one of those uh, old English clubs mm. to learn how to scrummage because that's where you, that's where you live and die. But by there's a whole rake of young Irish lads playing in, in uh, the championship in England. There is, know? yeah. yeah. You know, because it's an, it's an avenue for them. Like, if you look at, say, Copeland, you know, given it, it, he, he didn't make it to the academy the and he yeah. got through yeah. there. He got a gig in Cardiff and now he's got a, a big move. Rather back. You see, the, the, well, obviously, for start players, mature at different, people mature at different rates. So a guy who's coming out of the academy might be three quarters done, as it were. Mm-hmm. mightn't be ready for, for, for the Leinster team or the Munster team at that very highest level, you know, because you're talking Heineken Cup rugby, you're talking Pro 12 rugby, but maybe you're ready for National 1 or National 2 in England. Well, what, what I remember from the last... And that, that completes the cooking, as it were. The, la- the last game against Ponty, which is in the pool stage of the B&I in the last year, later last January, year, yeah. was it last January 13. Okay. Uh, you've got guys, like you're saying, who are, you know, they're semi-pro guys, they're... They, Mightn't be the fittest guys, but they've got the experience and they're gnarly and they're, you know, they're fairly decent lumps of lads. But then you've got the academy guys who are at a peak of fitness because they have to be because mm-hmm. it's ruthless in that academy. And if you're not on the top of your game, you're not going to last pissing time, you know. Yeah. So you've got guys who are supremely fit, but inexperienced against guys who are supremely experienced, but, you know, down the pub 
several nights a week. Uh, so it's it's in well maybe I'm exaggerating slightly, but you know they wouldn't be the fittest guys in the world. So it, it's an interesting competition. You've also got a situation where Ulster and Leinster, and to a certain extent Munster, because their academies are functioning quite well, they're churning out a lot of good players. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, Leinster, Ulster, Munster have the pick of the cream of those players coming out of the academy. But there's still, you know, if, if, if there's 10 players out of the academy and Leinster take five, that's still five very good players mm-hmm. who can have a career in professional rugby. And they go, and maybe they're not ready yet, or maybe they're, that's the level that they're going to be at. They go over to England, they play National One, or maybe for one of the lesser premiership clubs, and can make a good career for themselves. Mm-hmm. The better ones rise to the top, like Copeland did. <clears throat> and, but there's other guys but, there. But you there's, look at guys like, say, Garrett Steen. But you look at the, Steenson, I was about to say that, the, all his career the Exeter team, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. there was yeah. three or four. Uh, 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 John Hayes' brother. And the Hayes, Munster, yeah. Ulster winger as well. Yeah. Uh, Witten. Witten, yeah. Witten. So there's, there, 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 there are, the, the problem that we have is that the academies are actually turned out to be too successful. Mm. Somebody was yeah. suggesting that uh, there, maybe we should forge a few more ties oh, with London God. Irish again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Get them yeah, into you're the doing Premiership. This just to annoy me, are you? <laughs> well, I'm going to annoy you now, Dave, because <laughs> we can't let it go without talking about at least one of the Heineken Cup matches. So this weekend, obviously, Munster play against uh, Toulon then in Marseille. Well, Claremont and Saracens, obviously. Um. <laughs> <laughs> they'll, have see, they'll have got a great. Um, lesson from seeing how we did it wrong mm. yeah uh, and you know hope that stands to them hope we've hope we've done the groundwork for them and that they can uh, muster something because they're gonna have to pull out some miracle match led because yeah, Toulon are, p- are going to be picking an even even stronger team than they had against mm. us mm-hmm. you know? not sure about uh, Bota and uh, Ali Williams are still out I believe and they also have Havana back <laughs> with Johnny Wilkinson's fish yeah, it's I, a big I, ask for months. It's a huge, it's a ask. massive ask. It's a huge. I'd ask. love to see them do it, despite the fact that they they'll rub our noses in it. I'd I'd love to see them do it, get an Irish team in the final. But uh, well, particularly, it's a long shot. Particularly, you know, with all the talk of the French t- teams going to dominate and potentially having the same two teams in the final for the second consecutive second consecutive year, that it would be like personally, I want to see an Irish team get in there and break that. Yeah, uh, break the hoodoo. Mm. Yeah, because well, you know, eventually, you know, Vern Cotter and Joe Schmidt before him, uh, or when he was there with them, uh, built that Claremont team, and they're probably gone a season past where they, you know, yeah, uh, they're, they're. and also they know Cotter's out the door. <clears throat> um, the Toulon team has taken a good few years. I mean, they won, the, they they lost, should I say, the Amlin de Cardiff mm-hmm. in two thousand and ten, which is four years ago. Uh, and they've come on and on since then, and they won the uh, a, a year ago they won the Heineken Cup finally. Uh, and they've gone from a team of mercenaries to an actual proper rugby team now, and they're you know they really are. Uh, so once you get those two elements, you have all the big names. You mold them into a team. It's fairly unstoppable, you know. Uh, mm. it, they, they they're going to have to not play to their full yeah, from, potential, from and from Munster are going to have to be. get through. Munster have to play the best game of rugby that the played. province of Munster has ever played, mm-hmm. and hope to learn have a bit of an off day. Reminds me of what I said after the uh, or before the the match in Croke Park. Yeah, that's what Leinster had to do, and that's what we yeah, did. That's what they did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you know, here's to here, here's to them being able to do it, and hopefully they won't rub our noses in it too much. Uh, I don't but, think I don't think we'll have to worry about it. I just think there's too much. P- I mean, at the end of the day, there's just too much power in that Toulon side. It's mm-hmm. got it's, it's got hugely it all, powerful. It? It's, it's got every. I mean, there's no area of weakness whatsoever, they can run it, either they can physical or mental. They can I mean. Yeah. It's. I mean, e- even if you thought that okay, that this guys were quicker than say the Toulon players are more f- mentally, those guys are so strong as well because I mm-hmm. mean you look at them all and they've all done everything there is to do in the game. And the reason why those guys are the top players is because of the hunger that they have and that they always. Yeah. I mean, we saw it was just to take an example, Oli Larue. Oli Larue had done everything and he had no need to come up to up to the northern hemisphere and freeze his arse off. Wanga. <laughs> yeah, but Wanga, but. Did, 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 when he was playing for us, did he look like a mercenary? No, no, and that's because that's what the, the guys at that level have. They have that absolute unquenchable desire to win. Mm-hmm. And you look at even if they don't play the likes of Ali Williams, Baki Botha, Makito, that's what those guys have. They are. But I think if you look at it rationally, if money's look, just a way of keeping score. You, you have to look at 10, 12, 13 and the difference in the two teams. Yeah, yeah. Those, that's those three positions. That's you, yeah. That's I mean the class that they have in those three positions mm. and uh, the possible lack of class. Also, where Munster, where are Munster going to punch holes? You know, maybe James Downey, if they actually give him the ball, might punch an odd hole that they can 
run off but they, they, there is nobody that's the gonna best get... bet is not to try and punch holes the best bet is to be like stilettos um, and use Keith Earls to try and skip around Bastro I mean he has the footwork for it he has the brain for it mm. I mean he has the pace for it that's their best bet their best bet is not to try and match up to them in some kind of you know machismo competition their best bet is to be like guerrilla warfare is like ninjas and mm-hmm. just strike swiftly mm-hmm. and quickly not because if, if they get into an arm wrestle with and Talon, surgically you'll lose I mean there's no question about it if you get into an arm wrestle with Talon, you're going to lose and that goes for virtually every team in the Northern Hemisphere when we started to move the ball mm-hmm. when, it, when, it, when we managed to get some passes together yeah. you've just said 10, 12 and 13 for months like if they move the ball it's going straight across the field and you know unless Earls catches it in the right direction at the right time it you know it's gone into touch or it's going to break down and they'll get clobbered and turn the ball over Armitage or somebody will be over the ball and good they night for you <laughs> there you go <laughs> no it, Munster's best bet is not to try and get into an arm wrestle with them Munster's best bet is to be clever mm-hmm. beat them with their brains not with their brawn because that's what you have to do against Talon because you're not going to beat them with brawn well, you got to have a lot of brawn as well though you got to just oh, to yeah, keep Braun, you in the game Braun, Braun earns you the right to play but once you get there He's not going to do it, so you have to be cleverer than them. Yeah. The problem is, John, actually, at 10 and 12 in particular, have two of the cleverest players to ever play the game. Mm-hmm. Well, anyway, we'll see. Anyway, thanks many lads. Thanks many for watching. Cheers. Cheers.